Well, we, um, Adventists don't do much with Lent, and I suppose that's because it is primarily for us, how do I want to put it, we, we're familiar with the most um, superficial, if I, I, I could put it that way, aspects of it. We sort of subscribe to a parody of Lent, uh, not being a church that has followed traditional calendar stuff much. And so for us, Lent evokes this idea of, well, what am I going to get up for Lent, give up for Lent? And we don't smoke, we mostly don't drink, and we don't, you know, there, there are things we don't do already, so what do we give up for Lent? And I have joked before that I was going to give up butter, and it's never worked. Um, I don't know, maybe this time. Um, but that parody sort of aside, there's, there is a, 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 a deeper thing that we might think about. And that is in our year of journeying with God, as we think about what it means uh, specifically to dedicate ourselves to that journey in a different kind of way, to pledge ourselves more deeply, uh, to allow our Christianity to be the foremost part of our identity rather than secondary or, or tertiary parts of our identity. And by that I mean we are human people prone to all of the influences of culture, of politic, of family. Our identities are very complex and formed through a variety of experiences, our education, our cultural milieu, our ethnic and social uh, demographic identities, even our wealth, uh, our political affiliations, and so forth. So what would it mean if we said, I'm a Christian, and the first identifier of who we were was that we followed Christ? That's an almost impossible challenge I give you there. Because most of us never consider those other factors when we think about what it might mean to be a Christian. You see, I'm a Honus. I do what Honuses do because that was trained and inculcated in me from my father and his father before him and his father before him and all of the weaknesses and some of the strengths that went into that generation to generation have fallen on me. And now presumably I've passed them on to my son, poor boy, or lucky him, however you want to see that, right? Identity is a complex piece. So as we make this journey, one of the things that might help us on that journey is following Christ's life from wilderness to cross and getting a clearer glimpse maybe of how he related not only to his ministry but to the Father and how his identity ought to inform and shape our identities. Fair enough? Yes. Great. Now, I know that we are a predominantly quiet group, and I will not badger you about speaking back to me today. I, I'm going to try not to do that. But I do welcome, on the other hand, if I say, you know, fair enough, I welcome you to go, yeah, yeah, right, that's fair enough. That's perfectly okay. You should not feel self-conscious about that. And if you If you wonder if God is going to smile or not smile at you over this, Lee would be happy to discuss this with you after the, after the service. He has felt God's smile, and he know, knows how that works for him. Uh, so Jesus goes into the wilderness. It is the oddest thing. We, we see this very abrupt sort of transition when we read our Gospels. Even the, the, the more expanded account out of the Gospel of Mark, the more expanded account in Matthew, it seems really abrupt. Jesus is goes from zero to 29 years or however old he is, 30 years old, in a chapter basically or less, a couple verses in many of these, these gospels. We have very little information about his early life. We have the ancestries, we have some background, but he comes to the wilderness where his cousin John is baptizing. Now on the cover of your bulletin is a picture of the Judean wilderness. I do not know if it was as bleak then as it is now. I suspect that there was a little more water. I suspect that the Dead Sea wasn't uh, as stagnant and embroiled in mineral as it is now. I suspect that, uh, in fact, the Dead Sea probably came fairly close to the Roman encampments around Masada, if you know the geography of the area at all. 
I suspect that there were more palm trees and oases and springs. I suspect that there was even some forestation at one time in what might have been called wilderness. But this is how it looks today. In any event, what we mean by wilderness at the very least is a place where there wasn't civilization and habitation and where wild animals roam. We know from historical record that, in fact, the Judean wilderness had lions and other types of wild beasts that existed in the wilderness at that time. No longer, but they did then. So Jesus goes out away from everybody, immediately having done this very odd thing. He, the lamb who takes away the sin of the world, is baptized by water by his cousin John. He who is superior to John submits to a baptism of water by his cousin John. And this strange act we've explained before, for those of you who haven't been with us, I'll give you the two-second summary that hopefully will not confuse you but bring you up to speed. You see, as Jesus is beginning a ministry, he needs two witnesses for him to form a rabbinic school. He needs two witnesses, and John the prophet will be his greatest human witness, and the voice of the Father heard, this is my son with whom I, whom I love, with him I am well pleased, will be the other witness. From here, Jesus will be empowered to begin his ministry. But he doesn't leave baptism with this incredible experience of the voice from heaven and the dove coming down and this, this rapturous moment of God's approval. He doesn't leave from this moment and begin his ministry. He leaves from this moment, according to the text, and goes out away from people into the desert. It says explicitly to be tested by the devil. This is an odd thing indeed. The biblical note in Mark is that he goes out and there are wild beasts out there. And the idea is an evocation of two different things related that I hope we can hear in our journey ourselves today. Christ goes to a place of solitude and peril. There aren't farm stores, there aren't resources, there isn't shelter, there isn't a home for him there. The desert is a foreign place, and it's a place of personal peril. And here he, he is tested. It says bluntly, angels ministered to him, that he, excuse me, looked out for, cared for in this context. So let's Let's turn to that Mark and passage, uh, Mark 1, 9 to 15. I've been referring to verse 13. He was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended him. Now we know from the expanded version in Matthew's gospel that the temptations followed three basic lines. Why don't we turn to Matthew? and read those, remind ourselves of those if we haven't heard them. Matthew translates, if you are the Son of God, in another translations or another alternative translation is because you're the Son of God. Satan's not contesting his status as a Son of God. He is uh, going, to, going to try to tempt him where that is, is concerned. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, Matthew says that, Mark does not, he was hungry. All right. The tempter came to him and said, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, people do not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And the devil took him to the holy city. Now he's not in the desert, at least if we take this literally. And had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you do not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said. If you bow down and worship me, Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, 
Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil left him, and angels came and attended to him. You hear the different versions, and you see what he experiences. Now, we're used to the movie version, where Jesus is sort of transported, um, I don't know, any of these movies you see where someone is flown, basically grabbed by the hand and flown to some destination. So we have the movie version playing in our heads. Jesus is in the desert, and the, the, the devil grabs him by the wrist, and immediately they're on top of the highest point physically of the temple, looking down, and it's as if people don't see them, but they're there, and this temptation occurs. And then, boom, they're flown over to this other vantage point. I wasn't there. Could have been that way. But the desert is full of mirages, and spiritually speaking, the desert is this place where our minds do strange things to us and run in strange places. It is Christ's experience that he is hungry and the temptation comes to him, could you not turn a stone to bread? What an abuse of power. What an abuse of privilege. Though Christ is undoubtedly a tremendous power to serve himself in that way, quite a temptation. To make the divine gift subject to his hunger to his will, to his temptation, quite a challenge. And now he's tempted with power. Actually, he's tempted in another way. He says, the devil has him at the top of the temple, and he says, if you jump, won't angels sustain you? Again, I don't know where Jesus is physically. If we want to literalize this, he's on top of the temple. And not only would he dash his foot against the stone on the way down, uh, he would crumple and die. Multiple bro bones broken, it, it, would, it would not be good. I think the devil has in mind that Jesus is going to leap off this place and somehow float down, protected, that he'll not even dash his foot upon the stone, but just sort of lightly land upon the stone, maybe. Again, I'm going to my movie version. You hope the cable holds, right? There he is coming down. Jesus says, no. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. He's being tested now with something different. What circumstance might he place himself in in which God would or would not be able to sustain and protect him? But Jesus wisely discerns something. There's a difference between being put into peril or finding oneself in peril and presuming to place oneself in peril so that a point can be proven or made. There's enough testing in life not to add to your own burden in this. And the third temptation comes along. All kingdoms of the world will be earth. Now, that's the one I would have gone for. <laughs> Forget the other two. This one's easy. All right. Whole world, all I've got to do is go. The world is mine. That is pretty easy. That's easier than buying a lotto ticket, and if I won the big one, all I would get would be $340 million or whatever it is. It's easier than winning the lottery, and the odds are 100% win. Okay? That's the one I would have gone for. There's something very interesting happening here in terms of what we call the great controversy, what Ellen White wrote about in her book of the same title, this theodicy we have of good and evil, of Christ versus Satan. You see, Adam was created prince of the world. Adam was given dominion. Not dominion in the sense we've exercised it. Boy, have we screwed that up. Our idea of dominion is that we get to dump anything anywhere, dig anything anywhere, refine anything anywhere, wreck anything anywhere. 
That's our version of dominion. Drive out any species of any other animal from anywhere. Eliminate any species. From, that's our, our view of dominion. Our idea of dominion is that we get to do whatever we want with the planet, and that is not what God created humankind for. So let's just, a little sidelight there to deal with that distortion. We, we fail to read the text in Revelation, I will destroy those who destroy the world. There's a warning. Adam had dominion. Stewardship of the earth was his. All that was there, he was the crowning point of creation. He and Eve together, humankind, was the crowning point of creation. And they mistrusted God from the very beginning. And dominion, as we read in the Great Controversy, went to someone else. It went to a serpent who would be symbolically cursed, now on his belly eating dust, but he would be prince of the world. And in Job, we would find Satan representing earth in heavenly councils. Interesting. And so now the prince of the world comes to the Son of God and says, here's the deal. I know who you are. I know the course you're on, and we both know where it's going to end up. Let's make this simple. Bow the knee, and it's over. Everything is yours. Only it's not too subtle a trick. Because when the Son of God bows the knee to the prince of the world, the prince of the world is still the prince of the world. And Jesus didn't come so that Satan could remain prince of the world. He came to restore us and restore the Adamic, that means Adam's, the Adamic princedom of the world. He wouldn't bow. All the kingdoms of the world would have to be his by another means. And that means would be the journey to Calvary. That means would be a terrible, agonizing, humiliating, political death. Reserved for the lowest of the low and the worst of the worst. See, a good Roman death might be kneeling before a Roman guard and being run through with a sword. Quick little motion down into the cavity of the chest, eviscerating the heart, bleed out like that, dead. That's a good Roman death. Crucifixion, not a good Roman death. It's torturous death. Crucifixos, to torture, to crucify. Jesus chose that path in the wilderness in the context of solitude, danger, hunger, exposure, lack of shelter, and an environment in which he had no option but to trust and depend upon his heavenly Father. And what I want you to hear in this is what the text says. He was with the wild animals. Like Daniel, he walked among the lions. Like David, who shepherded sheep, he had to defend against bear and lion and fox and whatever else would come after him. There in the wilderness, angels ministered to him. Oh, this is an evocation, again, of something powerful in Israel's past. You see, Elijah would wander into the wilderness running from Jezebel, and angels would minister to him. He who would be translated without seeing death. Angels ministered to him. He was so wiped out that the angel wakes him up, feeds him, talks to him, and he goes right back to sleep. I don't know about you, but if you've been woken up by an angel, wouldn't you have a few things to say? Maybe a conversation. Maybe you'd want to do something for the angel. Not Elijah. He is so gone that he has to go back to sleep, and the angel waits and ministers to him. Talk about a testing time in the wilderness. He took precious water and poured it over an altar and depended upon his God to answer his prayer. 
But this goes back even further. The 40 days and 40 nights of Jesus' experience, and again, I've covered this before, and I'm just going to give this, throw this out there for food for thought because that's the kind of pastor I am. We acknowledge that it is possible that Christ is somehow supernaturally sustained in 40 days without food, without access, presumably, to water. Maybe he had access to a spring. Uh, Maybe angels ministering to him meant that they did feed and water him in this time, but it says that he was hungry. He had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. In Matthew is what it says. So we acknowledge that it's possible that he was supernaturally sustained in this time. We also acknowledge that humans don't live 40 days without food. And they most certainly don't live 40 days without water. And so if he's not being supernaturally sustained, we go to another option with this passage, which says the 40 number is really designed as a period of time to help us understand what's going on with Jesus because it's evocative of another number that has to do with 40. And that number has to do with the number of years that Israel wandered in the wilderness. Israel was 40 years in the wilderness. When Mark and Matthew write this, I know that at the very least they wanted us to think of that. At the very least, they wanted the reader to remember 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Jesus' ministry happens in a context, and this is part of it. And it's an important part of it, on this journey. So maybe, before we get to some of our other passages, you can turn with me to, um, I want to say Exodus 23. I hope I have that right. Exodus 23. I'm going to read starting in verse 20. This is an interesting passage. There's been a bunch of decrees and festivals and so forth outlined, laws given dealing with everything from social responsibility to um, justice and mercy and festivals, Sabbath laws, etc. And in verse 20, God says this, See, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. I'm sending an angel ahead of you to guard you and bring you to where you need to be. Pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion since my name is in him. If you listen carefully to what he says and do all that I say, he will, I will be an enemy to your enemies and will oppose those who oppose you. My angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, Jebusites, and I will wipe them out. Do not bow down before their gods or worship them or follow their practices. You must demolish them and break their sacred stones to pieces. Worship the Lord your God and his blessings will be on your food and water. Did you hear the food and water part in the wilderness? I will take away sickness from among you and none will miscarry or be barren in your land and I will give you a full lifespan. This is the definition of God's blessing. I will send my terror ahead of you and will throw into confusion every nation you encounter. I will make all your enemies turn their backs and runs. run. I will send the hornet ahead of you to drive the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites out of your way. But I will not drive them out in a single year because the land would become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you've increased enough to take possession of the land. And he goes on with other promises with the borders and so forth. But here's the angel of the Lord going before the people of the Exodus these 40 years to lead them, and he's not to be disobeyed. He's not to be disbelieved. He's to be trusted. And this angel, who bears the name of God, will drive out the enemies of Israel and will provide food and water. Certainly, a Jew reading this passage in the gospel would remember Exodus 23. Nehemiah remembers it as well. Let's just take a look back. I've, I've included four long passages today, so I do hope you'll take those home and read through them and just kind of meditate on them as you think about your journey and the times of testing. <clears throat> Nehemiah recounts, you saw the suffering of our ancestors in Egypt, etc., You divided the sea 
You led them by a pillar of cloud. You came down to Mount Sinai. You gave them regulations. You made known the Sabbath. In their hunger, verse 15, you gave them bread from heaven, and in their thirst, you brought them water from the rock. You told them to go in and take possession of the land you had sworn with uplifted hand to give them. You see, Jesus was in the desert, and he was going to be ministered to by angels, and he had a land to repossess as well. He had a land to go into. It was a land occupied by the prince of this world. This was a turf war. And when Satan said, just kneel before me and all will be yours, it was a trick surrender to the entire prize. Israel was going to a land that it would inherit. Listen to 16 because it's instructive to us as we think about our times of wilderness and our times of testing. But they, our ancestors, became arrogant, stiff-necked. They did not obey your commands. What does it mean to be stiff-necked? Stubborn. Literally, it also means if you've ever had a wry neck, you know, one of those kind of things where you had to go to the hospital and get muscle relaxants and all that sort of thing. It means that you can't move to the left or to the right, up or down. It means that you have a hard time seeing beyond the tunnel vision of what's before you. They refused to listen and failed to remember the miracles you performed among them. Then they became stiff-necked in their rebellion, appointed a leader in order to return to slavery. But you're a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. Therefore, you did not desert them. Even when they cast for themselves an image of a calf and said, this is your God who brought you up out of Egypt, or when they committed awful blasphemies. Because of your great compassion, you did not abandon them in the wilderness. By day, the pillar of cloud did not fail to guide them on their path, nor the pillar of fire by night to shine on the way they were to take. You gave your good spirit to instruct them. You did not withhold your manna from their mouths, and you gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, nor did their feet become swollen." What is Nehemiah telling God's people here? Jesus heads into the wilderness, and it reminds us of many things that have gone before in Israel's history. Angels will sustain him, and he will come out a victor. But he is evoking something. Whereas the people in the wilderness perished because of their disobedience and disbelief, he would not perish because of his disobedience and disbelief. Ultimately, he would perish because of theirs. Whereas the people were rebellious and stubborn and stiff-necked and refused to obey God and grumbled and complained and were arrogant and went their own way, God's faithfulness never failed them. Pillar of cloud by day. Pillar of fire by night, angel of the Lord, spirit counsel, manna, water from a rock, guidance, inheritance, hope, promise, forgiveness even in times of sheer rebellion. We are that people wandering in the wilderness. We catch an encounter with God and we turn around and we come back and we make for ourselves a golden image and declare that this is the God that's delivered us and we worship it. it sounds absurd. You say, I do no such thing. I wish I had that much gold. But our idols aren't made of gold. Our idols are made of pleasure, of ego, of false identity, 
of ambition, of greed, of empire, of dominance, of aggression, of desire. Our idols are sometimes institutional or political or military. Our idols are power and prestige and honor. Our idols are all of those things we run home to all the time when we seek comfort, when we seek to identify ourselves when we're running from reality, when we want to pretend that the desert isn't around us. And our year with God, our lives with God need to transcend that. We need to remember God's leading, His provision, His goodness, His graciousness, And this is where the Hebrews passage is so beautiful. As the Holy Spirit instructs us, today if we hear His voice, don't harden our hearts. As we did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me. Now there's God turning it around, isn't He? The Israelites saw their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, and we see it as testing us, right? God is testing us, the devil's testing us, tempting us, trying us. Our wilderness time is that, but Hebrews flips that on its ear. Our 40 years of wandering in the wilderness is a time of testing for God. Why? Because we are never faithful. Not ever faithful, never faithful. You see the difference between Christ who goes into the wilderness and the people of Israel who go into the wilderness? Between Christ who goes into the wilderness and we who live in the wilderness? We avoid even the wilderness sometimes. We don't even get that far sometimes. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. That I said their hearts are going astray and they've not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Not only God's rest at the end of the time of wilderness wandering, but the rest, the Sabbath rest that is spoken of earlier in Hebrews. This rest that is in what God has created and what God has done and what God has redeemed and what God has saved. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Don't focus on that word sinful. It's only a descriptive. The key to this whole thing is see to it that none of you has an unbelieving heart and turns away. Encourage one another. We have come to have a share in Christ. We have come to have a share in Christ. Jesus went into the wilderness and began his ministry with a time of testing. And thank God he succumbed to none of it. Thank God the angel of the Lord was there to minister to him. Thank God he emerges from that experience a victor. 
ready to enter a ministry with power because out of a wilderness experience, this time of aloneness comes reflectivity, prayer, self-encounter, a time of seeing all of the mirages of our wants and desires and illusions. Out of this time of instruction in the wilderness comes a time of centering and awareness and priority and trust. People of God, don't be afraid to enter that wilderness, but take him with you and do it with hearts that believe. And the one who brought Israel out the other side to victory will bring you through to victory in Jesus Christ now and forevermore. Amen.